Hey, what's up dudes and dudettes? Brad the Guitologist here. Next up on the bench, we have an Ampeg B15N. I believe this thing is from 1969. Oh, that's hot. This was sent to me by a fella. He said, thank you for taking on this project. I would like you to do the following. Replace the power cord, check the tubes, replace if needed, service, replace whatever needs to be replaced, and please assist in dating. I have seen these pop up a couple times uh, in pawn shops local to me before. Uh, never actually plugged in and played through one, so I don't know really honestly what to expect here. If I flip it around here, we'll see. Uh, we have no power cord, so we're going to have to... Uh, Put a power cord on it. We have six L6s, a pair of those uh, GCs, five AR4 rectifiers, so this is tube rectified. We've got three six SL7s in the preamp. So yeah, we've got uh, some octal preamp tubes. So this is uh, kind of interesting, really, for an Ampeg. Anyway, we're gonna open this thing up, probably put the power cord on first and start to get a sense of uh, what it's doing or not doing. We'll fire it up slow on the Variac, all that stuff. You know the drill. But first, a little history on the B-15N. The B-15N, also known as the Portaflex, was introduced in 1960. Ampeg engineer Jess Oliver, who has admitted in interviews to copying the B-15 circuit directly from the RCA manual, is also known as the first guitar amp designer to include Hammond's spring reverb circuit in a guitar amp with the Reverber Rocket in 1961. The B-15 was meant to compete with Fender's basement amps of the time. It was a single channel 25 watt head with a flip top double baffled cabinet. It cost $355 new and had a 5U4 rectifier. Later versions of the amp featured a cool Lucite Ampeg logo which lit up when the amp was turned on. In 1962, a solid state rectified version was introduced along with the now familiar blue diamond covering. And in 1965, the output was switched from cathode bias to fixed bias. In 1968, the amp was completely revamped. This version, an example of which we see on the bench today, is a 50-watt two-channel amp with four inputs, high and low for each channel, and a redesigned ported cabinet with a single baffle. The Portaflex family of amps have been used by a who's who of bassists from the 60s and 70s, from Duck Dunn and James Jamerson to John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin, Rick Danko of the band, who used the B-15N in The Last Waltz, and Bill Wyman of the Rolling Stones, who used a B-15N from this exact year, 1969, to record Exile on Main Street. That amp last sold at auction for nearly $50,000. Okay, here we are inside of this um, Ampeg. You can see how it's laid out. It's uh, actually not laid out too badly. Um, this thing does have some interesting construction methods. Uh, we can see here on the front panel the way that they've constructed the pots. The pots kind of have their own little boards that they're attached to with all the, basically the tone stack stuff on the boards. B15N, channel one. This is a CR10. That date code right there, 13469, that's from 1969, the 10th week. So this, this is a 1969 amp. 137, 69, that's 69 also. 69. So all these are pretty much 69. Other channels the same way. They've got the, it's interesting because they have this one, B15N channel 2. I mean, it's labeled differently, channel 1 and channel 2 in pin, but it's the same part number, so I don't, get why they would do that but you could see it uh, somebody had changed at some point changed the power cord we're gonna pull all that out of there this cap can it needs to be changed for sure we've got uh, got a cap can here it needs to be changed there's an old cap that needs to be changed there's a cap can down inside of there we will either have to change or restuff or something to that effect looks like we've got probably a single sided board here well, I'm certain it's a single-sided uh, through-hole board, but all the traces are up here on top. You can see exactly where everything is going. Kind of convenient. I, I, I mean, this is way better than a lot of stuff that you see in the era after this was made. Looks like we've got a resistor down here that's been really hot at some point. 
Uh, this cap is most definitely going to have to go. Uh, this Cornell Dubliers, these right here, these will likely have to go as well. These are probably okay, but we'll kind of have to see. Everything on the boards over here, that's a, that's ceramic, so that's probably fine. It's in the tone, tone circuit anyway. Yeah, there's not going to be a whole lot to this, really. Just uh, replace some caps and a cleaning, I think, and then we'll test it out. If nothing else, we'll get to hear what the thing sounds like. So first things first, I want to go ahead and... Well, that came right loose, didn't it? That's the ground right there. I'm going to go ahead and get this crap out of here. And none of that's even soldered. That's just on there with wire nuts. Not great. And then there's no retainer either, so that's not real good. That right there is flopping real loose. So obviously we have to do something about that. Let me get a retainer and a power cord and we'll go ahead and slap a power cord on it. But you know, like I said, some of the stuff I can already tell I'm going to have to do something about. Like this resistor here, which is really cooked. And uh, all of these caps. So let me go ahead and replace the caps. Probably replace that resistor. Though, well, we're going, I'm going to shotgun those three caps at the very least because I know that those are probably not going to be good either. It's just, you know, one of those things that's an experience thing. So let me do that stuff and then we'll uh, be able to give this thing a test. It should be interesting testing it out. I like this tube cage design. It's kind of cool. You got to really make sure that when you... Uh, get this thing back that you take this plastic out don't forget to take this out before you turn it on because you'll, get, you'll end up uh, just melting all of that I hope that much is obvious but <laughs> you never know sometimes we forget those things um, so what we have here we've got ooh, we've got some old uh, some old joint Army, Army Navy Sylvanias these are 6L6 WGB's it's kind of more on par with a 5881. 7826, are these from 1978, possibly? Not sure on the date codes on those. These Ampeg labeled ones are certainly original to the amp. They're labeled 952, so that's 1969. This is an interesting amp, though, because for its time, to have the uh, an octal preamp section like this, when I say octal, I mean with a base like this instead of the miniature tubes, it's just interesting. It's kind of an anachronism. You, you, these kind of went out of style uh, in the 50s, and you kind of didn't see them after that for the most part on guitar tube amps, but here you've got a full complement of, of them, 6 SL, SL7s, in an amp from 1969, so it's just an interesting design. Don't see anything on that. Uh, it's a GZ34. The cap can. Uh, this we're going to have to replace. We're going to uh, go ahead and do that. We're going to try to preserve all of these if we can. Hopefully nothing's wrong with the tubes. Okay, so here's the cap can out. We've got a 40, a 40, and a 40. All of those at 500 volts. And this is the original cap can. It's from 1969. You can see they're 1081, 69, 10, 1969, 10th week. I'm going to try to restuff this, I think. Although there's plenty of room inside the chassis, I just don't, I kind of don't want to mess up the chassis with individual um, caps if I can help it. But I'm going to see what I can do here. If it's possible, I'll restuff this one. What I might do is just cut it open with a hacksaw, restuff it, tape it back shut. Yeah, I don't know if this is going to even be possible. They, they've got this, they've got this sealed on here pretty good. Could probably heat gun it, I guess. Okay, that's pretty good and warm there now. It's turning, but... The mount on it is on there pretty good, too. I don't think I'm going to be able to get that off. That's stuck on there okay i don't know if i got that last clip or not i don't think i did so anyway you missed part of the show but i was saying um i went ahead and changed my mind and uh took my heat gun back to this and got this cardboard 
covering off of the cap can. You see it here in the vise, and I sawed off the bottom part of the cap can. So what I'm going to do is, is stuff this cardboard part and then get it back together right there on the lip, and uh, we'll do it. We'll restuff it and do it that way. That'd be a much better way to go. And the reason to do this uh, is really twofold. Um, first of all, this is a 40, 40, and 40 at 500 volts. I'm not even sure if I can get 500 volts in this configuration, 40, 40, 40. Maybe I can, even if I can though, um, I really don't want to have to order one and then wait for it to come in. Also, I'm not really fond of the company. The only company pretty much that makes them, I'm not really doing business with them anymore. So I want to avoid that if I can. Um, it's not a hard and fast rule. If I have to do, go that route, I will, but I just don't want to have to. So I'm avoiding that. And uh, also, uh, it's going to be much, much quicker because I won't have to wait for a part to come in. I can just restuff this one and go ahead and get it back out. And also, I think the difference in price is uh, well worth it. I mean, you're going to pay probably, you know, it's like five, eight dollars or something, maybe a piece for these, and it's, it's going to be more expensive to go with the cat with the can. I don't know exactly what the difference in price would be, but it is going to be significant. And here you go, if you want to see inside of the the actual capacitor, you can see how it's made. It's basically a roll with sheets, and you have a sheet of dielectric in between two conductor. Uh, materials and uh, it's just rolled together like that. I could probably get this whole thing out of there if I wanted to maybe struggle with it. But you can see what it is. It's almost like a big cigar or something inside of there. How it's rolled. Okay, I'll have to flip this clip upside down and post. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drill a tiny hole beside each one of these terminals so that I can pass uh, more of the lead down through it and it's going to be just more stable inside of there and uh, be an easier way of hooking it up, I think. Now then, what I'm, that's what I'm going to be able to do is just stick those in there like that then. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be the way to go. Hopefully I'll be able to fit all these in. I should be able to. I, I, if I have to stack one up a little higher, I will. Okay, so one of the things I noticed looking at this schematic is that the first node um, capacitor right there is a 30 microfarad at 600 volts on the schematic. Then it goes through this 1K 10 watt dropping resistor, um, but the cap that was at that position is only 450 volts, and it's a 20 and 20, and they had these in parallel I will admit that kind of threw me off at first and I, I did put the wrong capacitors in here so I'm gonna back up a second and figure out how to get uh, three 500 microfarads in this envelope I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to do it because the 500 volt caps that I have are substantially larger than each of these so you can see the difference in size right there you can't fit two abreast like you can with these and I don't think they're going to fit the same way, but I'm going <clears> to <throat> see what I can do here. I might be able to get away with just one 500 and two 450s uh, in this. I need to do some measurements, though, at the various points with the amp on. I need to see uh, what the exact voltages are at these various points. And I've got all of the tubes pulled for the moment because, I'm first of all, I'm not sure of the state of the tubes, so I don't want any of them you know sucking down voltages or giving me false readings so all i have in there right now is the rectifier tube we're going to measure here at the first node and see what we're going to need at the first node so for now i've just got, i know this looks uh this looks funny but I, I've, I've just got this power cord just kind of bodged in here for the moment and we're gonna dial it up on the variac and we're gonna see what okay at the first node what we're looking at in terms of voltage here so Go to 120 right there, and we'll see how high this gets. Okay, that's that's over 900 volts right there at that. Now again, we've got no, um, you know, no tubes are sucking down voltages or, or doing anything. We don't have any, uh, we don't have any capacitors really that are filling up. None of that kind of stuff. 
So really, we're showing this thing a lot more voltage than it's going to have, you know, with all the tubes and everything in it, you know, sucking down voltages. Like, for instance, I'll show you the same thing. Let's put the power tubes in. I'll show you the exact same spot with the power tubes in, and you'll see how much, how much it diminishes with just the power tubes. So we'll do the same thing. I'll turn it on, and we'll get to see what the voltage is. So I'm going to flip it on. You'll no see this voltage right here with power tubes in. Still getting up over 900 volts for just a few seconds there, man. That's that's a. I'm thinking we're going to have to go even above the 600. Now there's no filtering or anything like that at all, and again, we, there's no preamp tube, so this is actually higher than it's going to settle down to at the end of the day by the time we get everything in there. So the first no we've got 367 volts, but it briefly it goes up to what I say 900 volts. All right, so that's at the first node. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and check on the uh, let's on the other side. Check on the other side of that 1k. And we've got 370. Here's what I'm wanting to try to do. I'm wanting to try to get away with, instead of three 500 volt um, capacitors right here, I want to restuff that cap can. And I'm not, I'm not going to be able to fit three 500 volt capacitors in that cap can. It's just not going to happen. So I'm going to use one 500 volt F and T at this second node. So here's the first node. The dropping resistor goes here. Uh, so at this node right here, I'm going to use a 500 volt. But then these other two over here, they have 22K dropping resistors. So they're going to see a lot less voltage at these points. And I think I'm going to be able to probably easily get away with 450 volts at those two points. And this one right here, I'm actually going to up. I'm Because we're seeing 900 volts briefly at that point. And hell, the, the other one was 450. They had this thing wired in. Parallel, anyway, we're going to figure that out, uh, and I'm going to put two uh, capacitors right there in series so that we're, uh, we're getting up to, you know, the 900 working volts um, that this thing briefly puts out when it's first started up. Okay, so there's that corrected. I've got uh, one 500 volter and I've got two 450s, which I think is going to be just fine. That one's in the uh, that first position. Actually, it's in the second position. Excuse me. The first position, we're going to put two of these 500 volt capacitors in uh, series like this. And that's going to give us, you know, 23 or 24 microfarad at a thousand volts. I'm going to cover this in some tape. It'll keep it from kind of rattling around when we have, you know, hit some low notes. Might as well. Okay, so that's going to be nice and tight inside of there. And I went ahead and labeled this as well. Uh, restuffed in 2022. So it'll just fit right on like that. And that's that. Brand new cap can. Okay, while I'm thinking about it too, I'm going to go ahead and measure this resistor over here that uh, we noted was looking like it had been pretty hot at one point. But we're just going to go ahead and measure it and see what uh, the resistance is. If the resistance is where it needs to be, we're just going to leave it. And it is. 960 very much within the ballpark. It hasn't drifted upward. Usually when resistors drift, if they're going to drift, they'll drift upward from where they are. This is a wire wound resistor. Probably still really good. Uh, the discoloration is nothing to worry about. And uh, we're going to leave that in place. It should be a good resistor.
Okay, so I've reached a point where I have the power cord in, so that's done. So this is the cap for the first node, this is the two caps. There are some holes on the board, you see this hole right here, and there's some more holes on the board. There's a couple right here in the middle. Uh, I chose to zip tie these two, instead of, instead of trying to mount them on the back of the chassis, uh, like they had this one before. Um, this one's fully sealed. So it's a little bit more feasible to mount something like that to the back of the chassis. But the problem was, as you saw, it was kind of flopping around. It looked like maybe somebody at some point had tried to turn that screw or that screw had loosened and it was just kind of flopping, uh, just real loose. Definitely don't want that to happen with these because they have some exposed leads on them. So that's not really good. So um, moved it down here to the board and zip tied it real firmly here to, uh, through those two holes. You know, I mean, it's kind of out of the way of everything, too. It's not uh, it's not going to be a problem right there. I think that's probably the best place for them. Without maybe drilling some holes and putting some terminals back here and mounting them back here like that on some terminals, that's a possibility. But then I'd have to drill holes in the chassis, and it's just kind of, eh, you know, not feeling that one. So um, anyway, so that's the way it is right now. Replaced uh, this capacitor, this capacitor, these three capacitors that I said I was going to replace. I uh, haven't done these yet because I'm going to test them first to make sure they're okay. And if they are, we're going to leave those. I think they're probably going to be fine. The one that was over here, this big uh, black cat right here, this 1,000 volt, it's the line capacitor essentially. So it's, it's for reversing uh, polarity. We're not going to use the polarity switch. The polarity switch has pretty much been taken out of the circuit by removing this cap altogether. So uh, we won't need it because we've got a three-prong cord on this amp now, so it doesn't need a polarity switch. And just removing that removes the switch. That is pretty much it. We're going to, of course, clean pots, clean jacks. Uh, we also have to check the bias on the output tubes, check all the tubes in general. Getting pretty close now. Okay, we're back with this Ampeg. Tried to fire this thing up uh, last night and bring it up on the Variac. Decided not to film that part because I was just preliminarily seeing what was going on. And couldn't get anything. No sound at all. I've got uh, the speaker out here on the desk. I was kind of going that route at first. Pumped a signal through the input and... Uh, just kind of gave up on it after a, a minute or so because it was it was really late at night. So we're going to try it again and see what's going on with it. I suspect maybe I was wrong about these caps over here. Maybe we've got a bad cap or a bad preamp tube because we're getting no signal through at all. I'm going to stick a signal on the input. I've got it already injected here. We'll let that generator fire up. I'm also uh, using my little desktop amp up here. Um, as a signal trace and we're gonna just kind of follow the signal along and see where that is dropping so what we're doing here is we're using um, just a probe with a coupling cap on it um, and we're gonna trace the signal so if we hit anywhere with high, vo high voltage or any voltage is leaking somewhere uh, we've got protection for the amplifier up here oh. Go ahead and turn that on. So we've got a 1K wave coming in. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to trace it through the circuit and you'll be able to kind of hear what's going on. So we're coming in this input here, uh, right there. And the wire. Okay, the signal is coming on this wire right here. And we need to fire the amp up. We should get it right there as well. But we're going to go ahead and fire the amp up now. Um, like I said, I've got, I don't have a dummy load. I've actually got the speaker out here. So if we do get sound, we're going to be able to hear it. So we'll fire it on. Let the amp warm up here for a second. And we'll see where we can trace the signal to. Also, we'll take a look at our numbers here and what's going on here with those. We've got 118 volts, about 730 milliamps there with 76 watts of power overall, which is nothing alarming for an amp like this. Uh, as a matter of fact, it might be slightly on the low side. And let me just make sure that we're the standby. Okay, so that, that went down in power, so the standby, um, the amp was on in the other position here. So, But we've got nothing. We've got a signal injected on the input. I can hear the sound coming from somewhere, and I suspect it's probably 
probably resonating in the output transformer itself when I uh, turn the volume up. That's my guess. Maybe we've got a bad output transformer. That would be devastating for an amp like this because I don't know where the hell you would get an output transformer. I, fingers crossed, that's not the problem. We started at the input uh, right there. Signal, got signal there. This is coming out on the plate, so there's high voltage there. So we want to check, and we've got the trace that comes over to here. And then we've got on the other side of this coupling cap going into the. This is actually not going into the tone stack. It's going up to the tone board, but it's not going into the tone stack proper yet. It's just going to the board where it is going to these switches. This is the switching section for the ultra high and ultra low switches. So we should have signal on those switches, and we do. Here's the signal. That's going into the pot, a volume pot. That's coming out of the volume pot. So we want to make sure that same tone is present over here at pin one. And it is. Same, same volume and everything. Um, coming out of that, we've got a massively increased signal. Coming over here, we've got it here. On the other side of this coupling cap, we've got it. Uh, running up here. We've got it on the board, so now we've got it back into the tone stack. We want to look at where the signal goes to the next stage. I think that's actually being, is that being fed into the, it is, that's being fed. Look at that. You hear that tiny bit of sound when I turn, I'm turning this volume all the way up. Okay, that's being, um, that's being coupled by either RF or by capacitance in the wiring, like this wire that I've got here, that's being fed into this. You see, this is hooked up to nothing. This is hooked up to nothing on the amp. But when I turn this up, you can hear it out of the amp. Listen, when I take that wire off, you can't hear it. Actually, I can hear it just a tiny amount. But that, again, that's either RF going into the input of this amp or, actually, if I turn that up, you might be able to hear it. You turn it all the way up. I'm turning that amp all the way up, and I'm going to turn this one up. I can hear it here in the room. You're not going to be able to hear it. But I can hear it very faint coming out of that amp. You can really hear it. Listen. That's just either RF from the output transformer the flux being fed into this wire, or it's some kind of capacitance thing. Anyway, that's really strange but and interesting. But, okay, so we've got the tone stack. Coming out of the tone stack, okay, we need to look at pin one of the uh, phase inverter tube, which is going to be this guy. So let's look at that and see if we've got signal going to there. Okay, so we've got it to that point. Let's go to the input to each of the output tubes, um, which is... We'll go to pin 5 on the output tubes now and see what we get at pin 5. Okay, so we've got signal right there loud and clear. That's going into the out, that, that output tube. Now, let's check the other one. Okay, so we've got signal going into the output tubes. We've got nothing, nothing at the output. I don't know why we would have nothing on the speaker unless we have a bad secondary on the output transformer or bad output tubes. The output tubes are lit up. One of them, though, one of these output tubes, now that I'm looking at it, looks like it could potentially have a problem with it. But we've established that the preamp is not at fault. I wonder if it might be something with the jack, also the jack that I'm using. Okay, so on, on this amp, it's got an external speaker jack, and it's got this cable that comes out of the back, which is an XLR cable, that runs to the cabinet the original cabinet. It's got this that comes out and that plugs right into the cabinets that this came with. I might try just coming off of this. The external jack is supposed to defeat this when you plug in an external speaker. I think it turn, it basically bypasses this. I mean, I'm pretty sure that's what they're doing there. Let me see what, uh, what I can do just coming off of, off of this thing. Um, and we'll also pop in some different output tubes. 
for testing and just see what happens when we do that. One thing I can go ahead and say for sure is that the 450 volt capacitors that we put in there are going to be just fine. There's 420 volts right there, so that's well within operating specs. That's 419. Uh, so 420 volts uh, with a 450 volt uh, working volt cap is going to be just fine. Four, 483 on that one, so I was right. That one needs a five. The first one needs a 500. The other two with uh, have are seeing 420 volts, um, so 450 volt uh, working capacitor should be just fine. Now on this this first one, we're seeing 490 volts, and we made that again. We made that into a 900, basically a 900 volt uh, capacitor right there. So that's that's way over spec for that position. We could have actually gotten away with uh, a couple of 450s right there if we wanted to. Could have also probably even gotten away with a 500 because we're at 491. That's kind of pushing it though. We're right up. We're right up near the working voltage. I don't like to push it that close within 10 nine volts. <laughs> That's probably we did a good thing by by doing what we did there. Okay, this XLR cable on the output. Here's the external speaker jack. So we got a yellow wire coming out of the transformer going to the external speaker jack. Yes, we do. It's yeah. There's that yellow wire running in right down there. That's the center, uh, center tap for the secondary. Okay, so this has a center tap secondary. On one side we have a green that goes to goes to ground through a, re, a resistor. I wonder about this resistor right here. I should test that. What what we got? Five two hundred fifty ohms, ten watt. uh okay that resistor uh we would have to pull it from the circuit to actually to properly measure it so what we're doing actually is we're measuring the resistance of the secondary right there okay a note on this output on this amp because it's a little bit confusing the way the schematic has it annotated when you plug in an external speaker you have to have the original speaker cabinet also plugged into this thing otherwise it won't work the 250 ohm resistor 10 watt resistor is actually just a shunt resistor for the output in case something is not plugged in so it doesn't burn up the transformer or something like that the way this is annotated though it looks like when you plug in an external speaker that it's lifting off um, but what it's really doing is it's changing the tap from uh, the 8 ohm tap, which is normally what's being used, to a 16 ohm tap, and the speakers are then hooked up in series. So, my bad, and uh, we'll hook this up the correct way. Okay, so <clears throat> I got a test pair of output tubes in there now. No wonder these output tubes might be bad because, I mean, these are, like I said at the very beginning, these are WGBs. This amp calls for GC, 606 GCs. And these aren't going to cut it. These are like 5881s, man. See the different colors right there? You see how this, this has got some cloudiness, and this has got cloudiness, but there's some red mixed in over here too. This one might have either slightly gone to air, or there's some high hours on these, or they've been hot, really hot, too hot that they that they could handle. They don't look too bad other than that, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if these, this was a bad pair of tubes. Now we've got output to the to the speaker. So yeah, I guess that you can't have an external speaker hooked up uh, without the internal one. All of our switches are working. We're not going to be able to tell anything from the base because there's not enough base signal in a 1K sine wave to really tell. But that jack works. This jack. That one works. Channel 2 works. Switches work. Tone works. Let's try the first. Okay. That jack works. Looking really good right there. Okay. Let's go ahead and check the bias then. The schematic calls for negative 50 volts. Is that right? Yeah. 
negative 50 volts at the junction of the these 270 res, uh, bias uh, resistors 2.3 volts off from where it's where it, what it calls for on the schematic which is not bad um, I'm saying we're pr we're probably going to be with well within the ballpark right there on on the bias for 6L6 GCs, but I'm curious of what it was doing to these uh, 5881s right here um, because I think we were probably cooking those. Of course, if somebody uh, liked it using the amp with overdrive, th those would have less headroom and they would overdrive quicker than 6L6 GCs. But if you're using this for bass, you don't probably don't want that to each his own, but I don't think you would want that really for bass. I don't know too many people who use these for guitar purpose because they're just not voiced for that. You could change one of these channels if you wanted to come in here and modify one, but you'd have to heavily modify it to the point where you'd have to take out, probably take out the entire tone stack board and do something different with those switches and, all, and everything. So you'd have to replace pretty much everything up here on the front panel on one of these channels to, to really modify one of the channels for just specifically guitar purpose. You should still be able to play guitar through it. I'm not saying that, but it's, not really voiced for guitar with the cabinet and everything included. Yeah, we don't have a resistor that we can measure that's going from the cathodes to ground on the output, so that would make it easy for us if we wanted to quickly measure the plate current. We could calculate that. Let's flip the amp over and uh, we'll bust out the bias probes. Man, we are running some high plate voltage on these tubes. I mean, we're, we're nearly 500 volts. We're at 488 volts on the plate of at least this tube, and it's probably very similar over here. Got a bad socket, maybe? I gotta check what's going on. Maybe that, maybe it was a socket issue before, and that's why it was being finicky before. So we've got 32.2 uh, over here and 31.3 over there at 489 volts. So let's get our calculator out. Okay, so point... 0 0.313 times 487 equals 15.221 is kind of our 70% on uh, 6L6 GCs, but 15 watts is probably pretty good. The 5881s, I'm really curious. Let, let's, let's power this thing down and let's pop the 5881s back in there and see what those are biasing at. Oh, do you know what? Another thing I noticed right there. Let me do this again because we were at 116 volts on the input. Let's get it up to 120 just to be sure we're, you know, about where we need to be on that. Here's our, here are our numbers right here at 120. Uh, 81 and a half watts overall and 0.77 amps. So we're 500, sitting at 500 volts on the plates. Let's go ahead and calculate it at that because that's going to send our numbers up some. 0 0.0338 times uh, 500, even. 16.9. Uh, yeah, so I think we're sitting pretty good right there. Now, um, the max for 5881s is going to be a lot different, especially with older 5881s. Newer ones, you can get away with tubes that are at least labeled 5881, that are modern tubes like Softex and stuff like that. Uh, they will be labeled 5881s, but if you'll notice, you look at them, they're they're very similar in size and girth and everything to a, a, a modern 6L6 GC. And they will withstand um, much higher everything, plate currents, dissipation, all that stuff. 5881, it's not telling me max dissipation, but it is telling me at... 350 plate volts what the plate current should be so we can calculate that so at 350 it should be 53 milliamps so let's calculate what that would be in in dissipation terms so 350 times 0 0.053 18.55 so yeah i don't know maybe these would be okay in here that that would be the max i mean we're way exceeding the plate voltage rating uh, of them but I mean, I've, I've run tubes way beyond the max plate voltage as long as the dissipation was was okay. But I don't know, man. It, that's probably pushing it for those 5881s. So out of curiosity, I'm going to see how these numbers change when we pop those 5881s in here. Okay, so here are the 5881s. 
installed and we'll see what kind of readings we get now i'm uh, looking for this to be really on the verge of what these things can handle but but we'll we'll see here make sure both of these have light and they do all right we'll see this start to skyrocket i'm wondering if this is going to get above 500 here with these it is my goodness um why is this not Okay, this one's not conducting at all. All right, we're getting nothing on this side. I wanna swap these around and just see if that follows. Make sure it's not the probe, because we had a probe issue a minute ago, so I just wanna make sure that that's not it. Let's do that again and see if the problem swaps. If it's a tube issue, we're gonna see numbers over here and none over here. Nope, it's a, it's a socket issue. We got a problem with the socket or the probe. I don't know what's up with this one. This side is, so you have to take that with a grain of salt. Something's not right with that for sure. Let's do the calculation real quick. We're at um, 521, 38 milliamps. So let's do 0 0.038 times 521. 19.7, we're exceeding. We're exceeding what these tubes can handle. You're just cooking them for no reason.
Okay, so I think we have pretty much proven that this thing can rock up and can be a guitar amp. So yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, hit subscribe down below. Also, I've got t-shirts, merch, all in the links below. If you want to support me via PayPal, there's a link down there. I'd really appreciate it. And for now, see y'all later.